to become the author of the novel. <clears throat> the beginner should proceed through the following stages. He will invent and elaborate the plot. Now, the action should spring out of the characters, and the characters should spring out of the general environment. Therefore, the first dim, indefinable efforts of the imagination will be concerned with the environment. By the environment, I mean the place or places where the action is to pass, the general class and sort of people involved, and the broad effect of landscapes and other surroundings. The mind must ponder on these things until they begin to take shape. Then follows the conjuring up of one or two, probably not more than three at the outside, appropriate principal characters. And at length, when these have shown themselves, the nature of the action must be considered and evolved. Of course, it may well happen that the first naked hint of the proposed book will be a hint of an action or a situation, or of a character entirely separate from any notion of general environment. But the beginner must take care to carry that hint backward to a suitable environment first, and not forward into any detailed action until the environment and characters are more or less defined. After my first literary achievement, the publication of my short story, The Artist Model, in the magazine Titbits, for which I was awarded one guinea for the prize Titbit, and working in Fleet Street, I wrote my first novel, A Man from the North. It brought me neither cash nor renown. But in it, I wrote, there exists in the North a certain kind of man who was born to be a Londoner. <laughs> Myself the ugly duckling. In March 1898, I wrote an article on George Moore's novel, A Mummer's Wife. More than a masterpiece, it's one of the supreme novels of the century. Mr. Moore is at home everywhere. He writes of nothing he has not observed. And I wish to tell you that it was the first chapters of A Mummer's Wife which opened my eyes to the romantic nature of the district that I had already inhabited for over twenty years. These chapters are set in Hanley. The comic opera Les Cloches de Cornville played the Theatre Royal Hanley from the 28th of May to the 2nd of June 1883. George Moore came with the company because he was trying to write an English translation of it. He failed, but he went on to write about his experiences with the company. He called it a mummer's wife. In it, the owners of a draper's shop in Hanley take in a lodger, Dick Lennox, actor-manager of a company performing at the Theatre Royal. The draper's young wife runs off with him to become an actress and eventually dies in poverty. As a critic, I reviewed this book, and it was a revelation to me. It showed me the tremendous fictional possibilities of the five towns, which I had previously quite failed to discover for myself. A mummer's wife has influenced all my work. Even my great friend H. G. Wells had set a short story in the potteries in 1895, The Cone. I wrote to him in 97. My dear H. G., I've been away from the potteries nine years, and only during the last few years have I begun to see its fictional possibilities. Particularly this year, I've been deeply impressed by it. Anyhow, I am trying to shove the notions into my next novel. <sighs> An uphill task. Letter to George Sturt, 31st of January, 1897. My dear George, all day, and a beastly day too, I've been wanting to begin again on my novel, but couldn't centre my wits on it at all. It hasn't been seriously touched this year. 
I wait only for one little incident to shape itself, and then I can march on up to and ride through my great revival scene in the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel. When this is sketched in, I shall consider that the first part of the book is achieved, three parts altogether. Yes, I have known all along that a novel must have purpose, to look at the matter from another side. It must expose some aspect of existence in which the author is deeply interested. But it mustn't be didactic. At least it must only teach in the same way as experience teaches. All which is platitude. My novels will all have purposes. The purpose of A Man from the North is to expose a few of the hardships and evils of the life of a young celibate clerk in London. As for Sis Tellwright, henceforward to be known as Anna Tellwright, if it is not a sermon against parental authority, then I say it is naught. The Journals, 12th of September, 1898 Partly owing to the influence of Philpotts, I have decided very seriously to take up fiction for a livelihood. A certain chronic poverty had forced upon me the fact that I was giving no attention to money-making beyond my editorship, and so the resolution came about. Till the end of 1899 I proposed to give myself absolutely to writing the sort of fiction that sells itself. My serious novel, Anna Tellwright, with which I have made some progress, is put aside indefinitely, or rather until I have seen what I can do. To write popular fiction is offensive to me, but it's far more agreeable than being tied daily to an office and editing a lady's paper, The Woman. Moreover, I think that fiction will pay better, and in order to be happy I must have a fair supply of money. The Journals 18th of October, 1898 Today I made an arrangement with Bailey by which I am only to attend at the office four half-days and one whole day in the week. As I never count office work as real work, this means that I can do five full days of my own work at home, excluding Sunday. I hope to devote at least three whole days a week to Anna Tellwright, and to resume this journal with regularity. I shall cease now to work at such high pressure as I have been driving at during the past six months. 31st of December, 1899 This year I have written 335,340 words, grand total. 228 articles and stories have actually been published. Also my book of plays, Polite Farces. Also the greater part of a 55,000-word serial, Love and Life, for Tillotson's, which begins publication about April next year. Also the whole draft, 80,000 words, of my Staffordshire novel, Anna Tellwright. My total earnings were 592 pounds, three shillings and a penny, of which sum I have yet to receive 72 pounds, ten. From Anna of the Five Towns Beneath them, in front, stretched a maze of roofs, dominated by the gold angel of the town hall spire. Bursley, the ancient home of the potter, has an antiquity of a thousand years. It lies towards the north end of an extensive valley, which must have been one of the fairest spots in Alfred's England, but which is now defaced by the activities of a quarter of a million people. Five contiguous towns, Turnhill, Bursley, Hanbridge, Knipe and Longshaw, united by a single winding thoroughfare some eight miles in length, have inundated the valley like a succession of great lakes. Of these five, Bursley is the mother, but Hanbridge is the largest. They are mean and forbidding of aspect, sombre, hard-featured, uncouth, and the vaporous poison of their ovens and chimneys has soiled and shriveled the surrounding country, Still, there is no village lane within a league but what offers a gaunt and ludicrous travesty of rural charms. Nothing could be more prosaic than the huddled red-brown streets, nothing more seemingly remote from romance. Yet, be it said, that romance is even here. The romance which, for those who have an eye to perceive it, ever dwells amid the seats of industrial manufacture, softening the coarseness, transfiguring the squalor of these mighty alchemical operations. Look down into the valley from this terrace height, where love is kindling, 
embraced the whole smoke-girt amphitheatre in a glance, and it may be that you will suddenly comprehend the secret and superb significance of the vast doing which goes forward below. The Journals, 17th of May, 1901 I finished Anna Tellwright, Anna of the Five Towns, this morning at 2.45 a.m., after seventeen hours' continuous work, save for meals, on the last five thousand words. I was very pleased with it, slept well for four hours, got up with a frightful headache, and cycled through Hemel Hempstead to St. Albans, lunched at the George, and home forty-two miles. A T is seventy-four thousand in length. Letter from George Sturt, 15th of September, 1902. My dear Arnold, Well, I have read Anna, and behold, it is good, and I strongly approve. Bear this in mind, for I have some faults to find, and I don't want you to suppose that I think them damning. My feeling is that you haven't let yourself go sufficiently. The stuff is absolutely convincing, so far as it goes, only it has partially failed to reach me where I expect first-class art to reach. The people do not come close enough. I am not intimate with them. They are real, no doubt at all about that, yet only with the reality of people seen across the street or overheard in a bus. You have studied them as though they were animals at the zoo. And all you say about them is accurate, but... You have omitted to show them much more than that, which you obviously know and uh, might have shown if you had been so minded. In other words, your people are not quite creations. Instead of writing about them like the God who made them, you write as if you were a recording angel. Consequently, your book is a sort of document, a scientific treatise. You refuse to be emotional yourself. You are unimpassioned, will not take sides and all that. Consequently, you rob yourself of that help which you have a perfect right to demand from the reader, that sympathy with the subject, which would go out of your art and meet it halfway. You don't get at our imagination, but only at our intellectual judgment. Letter to H.T. Wells, 20th of September, 1902. My dear H.G., Knowing officially from you that for you no such thing as excellence exists, I will not conceal my satisfaction at your remarks about Anna. I reckon no one in this aisle knows more about the craft of fiction than you, except possibly me. And I am always struck by the shrewdness of your criticisms of novels from that point of view. But I think your notions about verbal style are fundamentally wrong, and nevertheless it just happens in this instance that what you say about my style is, I think, mainly correct. There is a certain consciousness of good intentions that has jolly well got to disappear. Also, I am inclined to agree that I am not yet artistically adult at thirty-five. I don't think the book falls off much after the death of old Price, and I think the emotional quality of the end is as good as any. As to the underdeveloped photograph, this is largely a matter of taste, but I trust you understand that the degree of development to which I have brought the photograph is what I think the proper degree. It is Turgenev's degree and Flaubert's. It is not Balzac's. Anyhow, it is the degree that comes naturally to me. I note the possibility of your having second thoughts about the book. I have had no reviews worth mentioning yet. Letter to Lucy Simpson, 18th of June, 1903 Dear Miss Simpson, I was very glad to have your appreciative letter, and it was very good of you to take the trouble to write it. I have been well satisfied with the general reception of the book, especially in America but I dare say that you are aware that in the potteries itself it has been gravely misunderstood by a lot of people. However, that can't be helped. I don't comprehend your general objection to provincial novels, seeing that the majority of all the greatest novels in the world are provincial. But Anna is not provincial at all. My characters grow out of their situations, which are not peculiar to this district alone.